Good evening and welcome. My name is Mike Babin and I'm the president of the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, the HKVCA, and I'm your host this evening. I'm very proud to be the son of a Hong Kong veteran, Alfred Babin of the Royal Rifles of Canada. Tonight's presentation is the first of a series of virtual events to be presented by the HKVCA. Because it remains very difficult for us to get together physically, a better word maybe is impossible, depending on where you live in the country, we've decided to try something new to help us communicate with our members and with others who have an interest in the Battle of Hong Kong. Our goal is to bring you a speaker each month who will present some aspect of the Battle of Hong Kong, the experiences of the prisoners of war, and of the POW's lives after the war and hopefully an aspect that you may not be familiar with. Now, before going further, let me put in a word now about our next presentation. And that presentation is going to be on Monday, April 19th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Our topic that evening will be the postal history of Seaforce. Our speaker, Sam Chu, will show how in the days before email, text, and cheap long distance calls, letters and their stamps were the only link to members of Seaforce. He has a very interesting collection of these that he's going to share with you. So please be sure to mark your calendars for this fascinating talk. Around the beginning of April, you'll receive an email invitation from the HKVCA with a registration link for the event. Now let's turn to this evening's presentation. As this is the first of our series of virtual events, I hope you'll be patient with us if we should encounter any technical difficulties. Hopefully not, but you never know. I'll introduce tonight's speaker, John Reed, in a moment, but first I'd like to give you a bit of information about how this virtual event will work. As you've probably already discovered, the camera on your device is not activated, so we can't see what you're doing and your microphone is muted, so we can't hear what you're saying. So uh, with over 100 people in the audience tonight, we felt that this was the best approach for us to take. But you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speaker both during and after his presentation. At the bottom of your screen, you should see an icon marked Q&A. If it's not there, try tapping your screen once or moving your cursor to make it appear. You can use this icon to send a text message with your question at any time. Uh, when, uh, or you can send an email to events at hkvcaca.ca, your choice. When you've typed your question, tap close to return to the presentation. At the end of John's presentation, he'll answer the questions that you've submitted. Uh, we've also set up a Facebook page for you to discuss the presentation and ask further questions of John. And I'll tell you about this more in detail later. So now let's turn to our speaker for this evening. I'm very pleased to introduce John Reed, the son of Dr. John Reed, one of the four medical officers dispatched to Hong Kong in 1941 uh, with Canada Sea Force. John was born in 1948, and after spending his first five years in Vancouver, grew up in Toronto where he attended Jarvis Collegiate and the University of Toronto. Uh, John, uh, John left university to become a filmmaker for most of the 1970s. After marrying Janet and starting their family of two sons, he became a freelance writer, magazine editor, and a partner in a magazine publishing firm. Over the past 10 years, John has written two books, Canada First, A Social History, illustrating why Canada didn't become part of the United States, which was awaiting publication, and The Captain Was a Doctor, the biography of his father, Dr. John Reed, the subject of his presentation this evening. So let's get John uh, on board here. John, if you can turn on your video. There we are. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to share a screen. There we are. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> 
I'd like to begin by saying how honored I am to be speaking to you tonight. Addressing the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association is a kind of homecoming. We are the family members and friends, some of us down several generations, of the 1975 Canadian soldiers and two nursing sisters who were sent to Hong Kong in 1941. It's a testament to this association that it continues to thrive 75 years after the war ended. In his excellent book, The Fight for History, historian Tim Cook suggests that we are all involved in preserving history. He says, and I quote, history is messy, tangled and complex. It is unsettled and contradictory. It takes effort to understand and its meaning changes from generation to generation. We must push back against apathy and indifference. We must tell our stories truthfully and bravely. For if we do not embrace our history, no one else will. This coming December is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Hong Kong. And for the survivors, the beginning of almost four years in Japanese prison camps. I hope my father's story contributes to the memory and understanding of those terrible years and the consequences. John Reed, usually known as Jack, was born in October 19, 1913 in Toronto. He was the son of Harry Reed and Olive, his wife. Jack was an only child and doted on by his parents. He grew up in the West End of Toronto attending Runnymede School. He went to University of Toronto Schools for high school and um, entered medicine at the University of Toronto. Here is Jack giving his first salute. At UTS, he was quite an athlete. Here he's captain of the basketball team and there are several of his friends with him. To his left, Doug Tadson and to his back right, Lenny Gage, who would die in the war. Here is a family grouping. You can see Harry Reed, where my cursor is. Here's Jack in his late teens, and over here, his mother, Olive. Jack um, was a very good student. He um, excelled very easily, and in um, 1933, began taking his summers in Muskoka during his medical school years. This went on through the duration of his time there. Here's a picture of him at Foots Bay, where he had a little shack and his friends and he would gather. In the summer of 33, after losing his mother suddenly to a cerebral embolism, Jack met Jean Hodge, who would be his first wife. And the two of them would be a very close couple during his medical school years. Jack and Jean married in 1939 after he'd f f finished his first year internship. And two years after they married, the war began. Jack and his colleagues were planning to do further training and that's what he did for the next two years. And I should explain why 1941 in August, when he and his friends joined up to become members of the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, the situation in the war was now two years old. The Nazis had occupied all of Europe. Britain was the um, island fortress standing alone with the help of the Dominion countries. And in the far, far east, there was other trouble boiling up. Jack and his colleagues um, went to Ottawa. Here is a picture of a group of doctors getting their five week training to be medical officers. And over on the left here is Jack Reed and right behind him is Gordon Gray, a medical school friend and the person he would be joined in his fate to go to Hong Kong with. Um, the training was brief, five, weeks was all they got and um, it was almost like uh, 
summer camp. Uh, here you see them on maneuvers. They don't look unhappy and it doesn't look like too much terrible is gonna happen to them. But these two men, Jack Reed and Gordon Gray would both choose to take at the, the end of their five week training period, a two week tropical medicine course. And when in the fall of 1941, it was decided to send two battalions to reinforce Hong Kong, they were chosen because of this tropical medicine uh, capability they had. What was the situation in the Far East? Japan had been um, aggressive for almost 10 years by this time. Um, they had invaded Manchuria in 1931. They invaded China in 1937. And the Japanese hegemony was under the program that they called the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. This was really just their way of gaining control of the whole region. Japan's problem was that they did not have raw materials and they had to seek them elsewhere as they were trying to do in China and Manchuria. Um, during this later part in 1940, they'd also invaded French Indochina and this had prompted the British and the Americans uh, to impose sanctions on Japan, which angered them and also deprived them of uh, the raw materials they needed. The two battalions that were chosen to go um, to Hong Kong in what was a controversial decision, um, but okayed by the Canadian government, Winston Churchill had eight months before said that uh, reinforcing Hong Kong was pointless. But he was eventually persuaded, I think for morale reasons, and uh, the two battalions were sent from Canada because we offered to send them. What was not known at the time was that um, any force there attacked in, in force by the Japanese would not be able to be reinforced or relieved or removed. So they were going to their fate. Um, they left in uh, the end of October 1941 and arrived in Hong Kong in um, mid-November. The picture you're seeing here is the Karsh photograph of my father just before he left for the Far East. On November 16th, 1941, um, these are the Canadian troops marching down Nathan Road in Hong Kong having arrived. Um, they would be dispersed um, by General Maltby, the commanding officer, uh, to the southern portions of Hong Kong Island we consider them untrained and not very competent troops and he put them in the rear areas for their training. Um, th three weeks later, to, um, to everyone's surprise unfortunately, the Japanese who they thought was a very weak force north of them um, chose to attack on December 8th. I'm going to show you here on the map um, this is Hong Kong Island where my cursor is. The Japanese were believed to have only a few thousand troops um, northern in China here, north of the new territories. In fact, the 38th Division, a hardened battle group um, of almost 60,000 was waiting, poised to make the attack. Um, what Japan was doing all at once to open the sea lanes to allow them to get to uh, Malaysia and Dutch Indo, the Dutch East Indies, was to take out all the impediments be, between Japan and those southern areas. And that meant um, Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines, and Pearl Harbor. All of these areas became objectives on December 7th, December 8th, at virtually the same time. Um, when the attack took place in Hong Kong, the, um, the original um, gin, make, gin drinkers line here in the new territories was the first line of defense for Hong Kong. Against the Japanese attack, um, the, the line collapsed within 40 hours and the troops had to be withdrawn onto Hong Kong Island. And here is Hong Kong Island in, in close up. The battle took place in three parts. The first part being the fight on the mainland the second part from December 12th to December 18th, the Japanese were softening up um, the defenders with um, air, air um, attacks and, uh, and firing cannons from the, from the mainland. And on December 19th, um, they made 
landfall. They attacked here on the northern coast. The, um, the force with which they, they um, entered the island, the number of troops they had, and because of the very tough terrain, the um, difficulty for defenders to move around meant that the Japanese punched down through the valleys here uh, very quickly. And um, um, they took these high ground uh, down the center where the main communication lines were and um, were, were very quickly starting to take over. The, um, the Royal Rifles, the Canadian Battalion was down here on Stanley Peninsula. The uh, Winnipeg Grenadiers were in this portion. And by December 23rd, things were getting um, extremely difficult. This is what, um, at the same time, Winston Churchill uh, cabled to the governor on December 23rd. There must be no thought of surrender. Every part of the island must be fought and the enemy resisted with the utmost stubbornness. The enemy should be compelled to expend the utmost life and equipment. There must be vigorous fighting in the inner defenses and if need be from house to house. Every day that you are able to maintain your resistance, you help the allied cause all over the world. And by a prolonged resistance, you and your men can win the lasting honor, which we are sure will be your due. On Christmas day, things were even worse. And the governor broadcast this to the, the um, garrison. In pride and admiration, I send my greetings this Christmas day to all who are fighting and all who are working so nobly and so well to sustain Hong Kong against the assaults of the enemy. Fight on, hold fast for king and empire. God bless you all in this your finest hour. Let this day be historical in the grand annals of our empire. The order of the day is to hold fast. The garrison surrendered six hours later on Christmas afternoon. What began then was the um, almost four years captivity for the people that were, were captured by the Japanese. But a question to answer to begin with was how did the Canadians perform in the battle? After the war, General Maltby tried to scapegoat the troops, the Canadians in particular, and he said um, for his own incompetence, there was a quick refutation by historians and Carl Vincent, Canadian historian, wrote in no, no Reason Why. It is a fact that wherever the Japanese ran into problems, it was usually the Canadians who were responsible. When the Japanese regimental commanders, whose standards were extremely high, recorded strong opposition, fierce fighting and heavy casualties, they were almost always referring to fighting against the Canadians. It is a very conservative estimate to say that at least half the Japanese casualties were incurred in battles against Canadian troops. Churchill was right. The Canadians' performance was to their lasting honor. The first weeks of captivity were very difficult for um, everyone. There was no food, there were no preparations for the troops. And um, the Canadians were finally lodged up here at North Point Camp where they were going to spend um, three quarters of 1942. For the first months, um, there was nothing to do. They were not put to work. They were not fed properly. Um, morale went down and they began because of the avitaminosis to suffer from grievous um, difficulty disease-wise. There was dysentery, malaria, uh, worms, wet and dry beriberi, um, pellagra, skin infections, all manner of things um, that were making things miserable for them. And then in the spring, the Japanese got them working as slave laborers. Um, in August, my father was the first to diagnose what became the real nightmare of 1942, which was a diphtheria um, epidemic. In the first two months, August and September, um, 79, um, 79 of the troops caught diphtheria and there were um, 38 deaths. And the reason for this was that though the vaccine for diphtheria had been uh, developed and was fairly widely used uh, in parts of Quebec and obviously in the prairies, there were people who had not been vaccinated. And these were the ones who quickly caught the disease. Um, the Japanese then moved 
all of the prisoners onto the mainland and I'll show you this is the um, this is Kowloon they were moved to a camp called Sham Shui Po uh, on this west coast of Kowloon and that is where um, most of the Canadian troops would remain for the rest of the war. During the time um, they were moved and in the Kowloon prison camp Sham Shui Po from October to uh, December 1942 there were 380 more cases but because the Japanese finally relented and gave some antitoxin, uh, which the doctors were able to use very sparingly, but helpfully, um, there were only 20 deaths. And that was the, um, uh, the state of, um, that was the state of health by the end of 1942. And I'm gonna read you um, what my father wrote in his medical diary at the end of 1942. And this is, um, a composite view of the state of the Canadian troops. Rifleman X is not so well as some of his fellows, but much better than others. He can and does go on work parties at least part of the time. He's very thin, having lost 20% of his former body weight, and he appears about 50 years old, though he is only 30. There are cracks at the corner of the mouth and patches of dermatitis in and around the nose. He has a deep ulcer on the calf of his left leg. His tongue is sore smooth and red, with a deep furrow down the center. Two teeth are missing, are chipped because of, of pebbles in their rice, and several other teeth are grossly carious, so he has difficulty in chewing his food. He complains he cannot read ordinary print, but he can make out newspaper headlines. Bright sunlight causes excessive lacrimation. He complains of constriction, like a band around, around his chest. His history includes malaria with two relapses, and he has just recovered from one of several attacks of diarrhea. He states that both lower extremities are numb from thigh level to the toes. The right great toe is deformed where a tropical ulcer is healed. He staggers in the dark, but manages moderately well in the daytime. He has some numbness of the hands, especially the fingertips. Nocturnal frequency of urination has disturbed his sleep for so long that he regards it as an integral part of his existence. He does not appear greatly concerned over the usual anxieties of life. That was the general state of health when a month later in January 1943, the Japanese announced that 660 Canadians were going to be sent to Japan to work as slave laborers. And one officer was to accompany them and he was to be a medical officer. Um, it was my father who was selected to go with them. Um, the state of mind of the men he was leading, um, I can give an example. This quote from Lance Corporal Robert Warren of the Canadian Provost Corps. This is what he said. In order for a prisoner to survive, he must shut down his feelings. He functions with only those feelings that help him survive and keep him sane. The feeling we could not suppress was uncertainty. The moment we were taken prisoner, we were being terrorized, undergoing extreme emotional stress. We didn't stop to ponder it because we were busy adjusting to a hostile environment. The irony is that when you have adjusted to a bad environment, you are mentally ill. In striving to survive, we were conditioning ourselves for neurosis and psychosis in our normal world. On January 19th, uh, Reed and 663 Canadians were shipped from Kowloon to Nagasaki. A group of about 150 were separated out to go to a mine at Omin near Kobe, and Captain Reed and 500 men were taken on to Yokohama. The camp they were taken to, um, originally called Tokyo Camp 5, or later named Camp 3D, was at the Nippon Kokon shipyards, the biggest shipyard in Japan. And the 500 men were going to be put to work as slave laborers. The um, state of health is as I've described. And the Japanese wish was to um, extract as much work from the men um, with as little food as possible. And um, they were to work 13 days out of 14. So Reed was presented with um, 
an unusual situation in that he was not a line officer, he was now a commanding officer as well as medical officer, and um, he was faced with a completely new situation on his own. He had learned a lot though in that first year at uh, North Point Camp and Sham Shui Po, and he dove into his responsibilities. Um, the, the first thing he realized was that without medicines, which they had none of, um, the, the real thing he could do was save the men from work. And he began um, as best he could to develop a sensible understanding relationship with the Commandant of Camp 3D, a lieutenant named um, Maseo Uamori. Now it turns out that this was good luck because Uamori was slightly above the, um, the um, I know what's going on there. I just want to show you as we go forward where they made their trip. They, they arrived in Nagasaki here and were entrained here to Tokyo Camp 3D. Um, Masao Uramori had been uh, a stockbroker before the war. He had a little bit of English. And my father realized that if he worked his psychology as best he could on this man, that slowly but surely he might be able to bend him to his will. And I would say that um, over time, that was the great success he was able to win and uh, for the benefit of his men. The reason that, that um, this was so important was by keeping men back, they were able to rest up, um, heal from whatever infections they may have had in a quicker way. So my father um, developed a number of ways to um, keep up the, the um, amount of food that they were getting um, while slowing down how many had to work and how often. He had what were called um, slow walking groups, groups that went only every other day or every three days. Um, and he was very successful in keeping men back. Um, however, in the middle of 1943, the Japanese decided they were going to start lowering the rations even further. My father um, argued and argued and argued that this was only going to be disaster for everyone, that the men would not be able to work and they were going to, um, uh, in, in, in some way, be affected physically that would, would mean death likely for all of them. The um, Japanese were unwilling to listen and as they moved into the um, winter of 1943-44, things really began to um, come apart. Between December uh, 1943 and April 1944, uh, Reed lost 14 of his men, and 11 of those were to um, um, tubercu um, sorry, tuberculosis, which was, um, part, sorry, pneumonia, which was the, um, the killer. He had no medicines with which to combat the infection, um, and it was a disastrous winter. There was a um, there was no fuel for the stoves. The uh, food was cut back and um, it was a terrible, terrible time. Um, there was one success in um, January, 1944, uh, two brave men, Charles Clark and a man named Cameron were able to sabotage the, the um, shipyard by um, uh, producing a sort of time bomb it was a candle, um, time to burn down and start some um, combustible things in a storeroom in one of the um, shops that was on the grounds of the uh, Nippon Koken shipyard. And sure enough, the fire did a great deal of damage, which um, put part of the shipyard out of commission for months, and the men were never caught. Um, Another highlight for my father in early 1944 was that two Americans came into camp. Um, a man named um, Ensign George Pollock was the one who became my father's best friend during the war. Um, and this was a, um, an, a help to him, having had no one really to talk to through the period of time that he'd been in command here. Um, he he himself had developed um, a way of looking at what he was trying to do. And this was my father's policy that he wrote down in his secret diary, a medical diary, 
Um, and he put down his philosophy in case he himself died. He said, the policy I've always held as the final criterion is to consider the main factor is not illness, nor even disability, that may be more or less permanent, but to consider as the main factor the danger to life in the reasonably near future. Thus, my endeavor here is to take back as many men as possible to Canada, whether well or ill, and not to concentrate on complete health. I would rather return 500 men in various stages of beriberi, which, in past, which perhaps in future can be cured, rather than to return 300 men in good health and leave 200 dead behind. He was very successful. And in fact, the Commandant Yuramori was um, being criticized by the uh, commanding authorities for how many men in 3D were not working at any given time. Um, as 1944 progressed, um, what became clear is the, um, the Americans were getting closer. Uh, they began to see aircraft, um, there were photographs being taken. Um, and then finally, in the summer of 1944 and into the fall, the, um, the Americans began bombing. The uh, result was that um, very little work was done at the shipyard, which was damaged. Uh, but the men were in peril because of um, being located at Yokohama, between Yokohama and Tokyo. And they had some very, very frightening times when there were heavy bombing raids, especially at night. Um, moving into 1945, uh, the bombing became increasingly greater and um, the, um, the decision on the part of the Japanese was that they would move prisoners away from likely areas for bombing, having thought before that, that the prisoners might stave off bombing taking place. But of course, the Allies had no idea. I mentioned George Pollock, and I, I want to read something that um, he himself wrote, having got to know my father. They spent 15 months together in prison camp. And he said, we helped each other retain our sanity and survive in the sort of situation we found ourselves one develops a way of judging other people, which is quite different from that, which is common in more conventional circumstances. In our situation, one required complete faith and reliance in one another. If and when that connection was established, it became an enduring one. I admired Jack's capabilities and devotion tremendously. Jack retained his sense of humor. I mention this in particular because I have found that a great many people who find themselves in positions of responsibility entirely lose theirs. Jack took his responsibility for his men as seriously as anyone I have ever seen, but he didn't lose his sense of humor, and the men loved him for both reasons. In the spring of 1945, um, the camp was split up. Men were sent in different directions, um, and Jack Reed and 200 men were sent north to Sendai Camp 1B. This was um, a coal mining camp and the camp itself was atrocious in terms of its facilities and the work the men had to do was um, brutal um, underground in appalling conditions, um, overheated, uh, stale air, risk of um, falling coal, the whole thing. Um, they were going to be there three months um, and could see that the war was coming to an end if they could survive. Um, Reed found at Sendai camp two other groups. There was a Dutch group um, and a British group. Um, there were about 600 altogether once the 200 Canadians were there. And here my father made uh, his second friend, the captain, um, Abe Franken, Adelbert Franken, who was the head of the, um, the Dutch East Indies forces there. Strangely enough, in these um, crude and difficult circumstances, my father and Franken discovered they had a mutual love of music and they began to compose when they had time in the evening songs together. And they actually, in the end, produced quite a few songs which were preserved um, and brought home along with his medical records by my father at the end of the war. Uh, things were coming to a head. The Americans were um, soon to either invade or otherwise bring Japan to its knees. The bombing increased. Um, 
within Japan itself, there was a lot of turmoil because there was a, an army faction that did not want to surrender. Hirohito, the emperor, was in favor of surrender. Um, and finally, um, after being told that the Americans had a very, very powerful bomb, um, it took the dropping of a bomb on Hiroshima to make the Japanese realize just the power of um, the Americans' new, new weapon. Um, with the bomb in there and then in Nagasaki and also the Soviet um, declaration of war on the Japanese, the war quickly came to an end in August. Uh, my father um, and his men waited some weeks. It was going to take some time for them to be extracted. The Americans started dropping supplies. Um, things went extremely well. Um, as, as soon as um, supplies came, the men began to um, uh, put on weight very quickly. And um, um, the Americans were getting set to extract them um, by ship and by train. That was the next stage. So the, um, the end of the war for my father was to bring from Sendai camp um, ahead of his men a group of sick that he wanted to get down to the hospital ships. And so he took a special train uh, in early September, 1945. And from there was separated from his men um, because he couldn't go back. And so he was in a, in a sense um, finished. He was on his way home. And I should point out the statistic. Um, there were thousands by the end of Allied prisoners in Japan. There were in the end about 1,100 uh, Canadians in various prison camps in Japan. Um, the death rate in my father's camp was 4.5% versus 16% for all of the other camps, the Canadian camps in Japan, which is a testament to how well he was able uh, to make things better for his men and to keep their spirits up. Um, Jack Reed returned home um, to Toronto on his birthday, October 6, 1945. He'd been away for exactly four years. Um, his wife, Jean, my mother, um, was overjoyed and um, they uh, began to consider their post-war life. Here I have failed, and I've done this before, to show you um, one of the slides I really should have shown you earlier. This is the um, staff at Camp 3D. In the center here is Commandant Uramori. Uh, and as you can see, this is a pretty tough looking bunch of guys that my father had to contend with. Here I've failed to show you until now. This is Sendai Camp where they um, were working in the coal mine. This picture is of my father um, in November 1945 when he was taken to Ottawa for debriefing. Um, he's starting to gain weight, but not looking that great. In December, he and my mother went to New York and on the right, you can see um, George Pollock, the great friend he made at Camp 3D. This is at the Copacabana Club in New York City. And, um, they had a wonderful week together, one of the great weeks for all three of them that they spoke of many times later. But they were starting their new life together, um, post-war, my parents, and um, it was going to be difficult um, for every one of these returnees. George Pollock himself wrote this. He said, those years in Japan changed each and all of us. One might think that after those years, one would come home and be happy as a pig in mud in all the things we had missed. On the contrary, I think we built up such a romanticized and idealized vision that when we came to reality, it left us with some sort of unsatisfied hunger. And we flailed about in all sorts of foolish ways and wreaked havoc and didn't do ourselves or a lot of other people any good. This would be the case for my father. Um, he embarked on his return to the civilian life very quickly. He got his um, fellowship in cardiology in the first year he was back. Um, my brother Tony was born in 1946 and my father was offered um, a staff position at the Wellesley Hospital, which was a division of the Toronto General Hospital. It seemed like the ideal re-entry point 
Um, my father couldn't settle down. He did not take the position at the Wellesley Hospital. He decided he would uh, accept an invitation back to um, a private clinic in Vancouver where he'd spent a year in 1940. And um, in doing so, I think showed um, the people who knew him well that he wasn't the same man that they knew who'd gone away. He, he left for Vancouver in November, 1948. And um, my mother was to follow with my brother, Tony and I, I was a baby. Um, six weeks later. The chaos that was now to be unleashed was that in the intervening time before my mother arrived, my father had met another woman, uh, a woman named Kathy Gill Gillies. Catherine Gillies was a, a nurse um, about nine years younger than my father, um, someone who'd wanted to be in the war herself and had just missed out. And somehow, um, the meeting of these two uh, was a meeting of um, extreme passion. Um, I have to move quickly on this section of the story, but essentially the next six years was one of extreme chaos in which my father um, pleaded with my mother that she was the only one he needed and he must have her and she must understand his difficulties and that he was not himself. And at the same time, he continued this passionate affair with Catherine Gillies, which led in fact to a baby out of wedlock in 1950. Um, this led to more chaos where my father asked for a divorce so he could legitimize the baby, um, which was done and um, he was supposedly going to remarry my mother. That didn't happen. Um, it was this push and pull, pull and push, where my father could not make a decision about what he was going to do between what were now two families, two women, and two sets of children. Um, and finally, it came to a point with all the love my mother had had for my father and all the wish she had to help him, she realized that he was stuck and was not going to change and that she would have to change things. And she made the decision finally to leave Vancouver in 1954. It was not a safe and easy um, departure. My father by then was quite unpredictable. He'd been become somewhat abusive and um, it was a, a difficult extraction. But what came from that was um, finally a settling down. My mother returned with my brother and I to Toronto, uh, where we grew up. My father then decided to um, settle down. Um, I'm going through now to show you my mother after the war, uh, Catherine Gillies, the woman he met. This was a family portrait at our house in Vancouver um, in the middle of this chaos. This would be about 1950-51. And here is Jack Reed with um, Catherine once they'd settled um, at the house where we had once lived. He came to Muskoka each summer to see Tony and me for a couple of weeks. This went on for about 10 years. And here we are. Uh, I'm on the left, my brother Tony on the right. This would be in the mid 50s and my father. Um, in 1974, he um, had been practicing medicine um, up until then at the private clinic, and suddenly he suffered um, an acute case of encephalitis. He was um, extremely ill, um, and in fact would never be himself again. In this picture, you see him in um, June, I believe June 1974, six months after the encephalitis attack. He's shorn because of a biopsy, a brain biopsy, and he's standing beside his son, Jock, who's going to be married on this very day. You can see Jock, um, another son, Sandy, and another son, um, Tavish, on the right. Um, the next five years for my father uh, were an up and down and final slide in his health. Um, he was never able to practice medicine, medicine again. And in 1979, was hospitalized um, in late spring and never came out of Shaughnessy Hospital. He died um, of pneumonia 
like so many of his men in 1944, um, on July 7th, 1979, he was 65 years old. That is the story of Jack Reed. And I feel I've, I've rushed it and there are probably some things that I meant to tell you um, that I didn't feel I've had time for. But to end, prior to questions, I would like to um, go back to August 1945. This is a picture after the liberation. These men are, are waiting to be extracted. This is in Japan at the camp in Sendai. Here where my cursor is, is my father. Beside him is Captain Adelbert Franken, Abe Franken. And these were the two men who collaborated on so many songs um, during those strange months that they were at Sendai together. The other people you can see here are another officer of the Dutch East Indies, a British officer, and these are some Japanese that are obviously are now friends. Um, this is the music book my father brought back with his medical records with all the songs that he and Franken had written. And this is the song um, I'm going to play for you now. It's possible that um, two relatives of Franken's are listening to this right now in, um, in Holland, in the Netherlands. One is uh, Marjolein de Klerk, his granddaughter, who's been a great help to me. The other is Martin um, Winnege, who um, is the great grandson of Abe Franken. And I'd like to um, dedicate this song of Jack Reed and Abe Franken um, to those relatives of, uh, of Abe Franken's. This is sung by Susan Hurst, a relative. Pardon me, I need her. got the jailhouse blues, oh, I'm blue both night and day. Can't see no stars, cause the boss shot them away. Got the jailhouse blues, just as blue as I can be. John, thank you very much. Um, that was a very, very interesting presentation and I'm sure a very difficult story for you to tell. And uh, I just want to express uh, the appreciation of all of us uh, for your having the courage to tell that story. So thank you. Um, now, uh, folks in the audience, uh, if you would like to ask questions, uh, feel free. We have had a few questions come in, so um, I, we probably will not get to all of them tonight, but don't forget there will be, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, a, a Facebook page where you can continue asking questions after tonight's uh, session is finished. So. Um, one of the questions from uh, Mona, how long was Dr. Reed at Camp 3D? My father has mentioned him in June 1944 in connection with Shinagawa Hospital. Yes, that's correct. Shinagawa was nearby um, and my father was occasionally there to treat patients. Um, he was in 3D uh, for two and a half years from uh, the time they arrived in January 43 until May 1945. All right. and. Uh, thank you. Andrea would like to know who was the medical officer left in charge of medical problems at Shamshupo, presumably when you're, your father yes, there were, was a man. There were four Canadian doctors, uh, two for each battalion. The commanding officer was um, Major John Crawford, 
Um, Martin Banfill was another one, um, and Gordon Gray, the man who was in the pictures I showed you, was the third. So there were four doctors all together. The other three remained in Cham Shui Po for the rest of the war. Uh, Cheryl Mercer says, I recently read your excellent book. Did you feel at the time that your upbringing was unusual? Have you been able to lead a stable life? Yes, it was certainly unusual because at that time, um, divorce was very uncommon. I grew up in a neighborhood where um, I didn't know any other families that were um, with, without fathers. Um, so in that sense, I think Tony, my brother and I um, did feel um, in a different situation, but we were also in a, a three generational home. We were in my grandparents' home. That's where we grew up. Um, they took us, took us in and uh, we had actually, a, I think a, a very, very stable and um, warm upbringing um, in those circumstances. Um, Oliver uh, says, uh, please tell us about the help your father gave to the camp commander who was accused of war crimes. Yes, I, I had to skin by that. This was important. Uh, my father uh, really valued the relationship he was able to develop with Yuramori. Um, he knew there would probably be war crime difficulties and he wrote a letter hoping before he left Japan, this would help Yuramori. Um, Yuramori though was charged and my father wrote an affidavit in 1946 to say he did not believe he should be tried as a war crime criminal. He was charged in any case. Um, the trial went ahead in 1947 and my father in quite great fury sat down and wrote another affidavit um, and sent it to the um, American lawyer who was defending Yuramori. Uh, this actually, this um, American lawyer said that the, um, the, uh, the impact of Reed's uh, affidavit was what got Yuramori a suspended sentence and Yuramori the next year in 1948 wrote a very long letter of thanks to my father, um, hoping that they could be in touch. I should just finish that story by saying he sent a bunch of canes as a present the next year to my father. And 14 years after my father's death, at the age of almost 90, Yuramori was interviewed by a newspaper in Tokyo saying he was hoping he could reconnect with Captain Reed, who he'd become a good friend with in the war. And it was only after research by a Japanese friend that they learned Captain Reed had died many years earlier. So it was a sadness. Um, Brian would like to know, did Jack ever receive any psychiatric analysis or help? Not as far as I know. Um, Joanne would like to, uh, Joanne made the observation that there's so much investigative work that's gone on into the telling of this story. And she'd like to know if you could tell us a bit about uh, how you did your research for the details. It's immersion. Um, over a long period of time, I didn't think I actually would be able to write this story. Trying to imagine my father's experience seemed beyond me, but I kept um, interviewing people. I kept accumulating information over many years. Um, I think once I made a decision that I could do the story and that I should do the story, I just would follow um, every direction that my own curiosity told me I needed to know about. Um, so it was a long process, uh, took, it took a lot of um, investigative work, you're absolutely right, and um, you know, three or four years to actually write, so it was a big job. Thank you. Joanne has a couple of questions. Uh, first, how was it that your father was selected to go to Japan? And secondly, were you able to discover what his debriefing consisted of? I think you mentioned that he was sent to Ottawa after his return for debriefing. Yes, as far as I know, uh, the evidence seems to be from Captain Banfield, the other doctor. He thinks it was straws were drawn as to the doctor who would go to Japan. I, I do know that Crawford, the senior medical officer, was not going to go. So it may have been between the other three that straws were drawn. My father in the end though said um, he, was, he was glad he went. He thought it was, um, he learned a lot. He, he felt he was very effective. Um, and so that was the result. Sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, the second part, were you able to, uh, well, 
how was he selected? You answered that. How were you able to discover what his debriefing consisted of? Yes, um, the debriefing I have. That was of great value to me. It was about 200 pages typewritten. Um, he was interviewed by a, a medical historian in the Army uh, over a period of time in October, November 1945. And that's been a very helpful document. Uh, Mike would like to know, what was the life expectancy of the men who did come back? I can't be exactly sure, but I, I think that the studies that have been done um, show that, that their life expectancy was greatly shortened. And um, I don't have the details, I don't have the statistics for that because that wasn't my focus, but just um, by, by knowledge of, general knowledge of the situation, I know that many died young. And a question from Janet, what kind of relationship do you have with the other children in your family? Wonderful relationships. My brother and I, of course, are very close. Um, with the four children of my father and his second wife, um, a, a relationship has been developed, I would say over the past more than 20 years. We are now extremely close. Um, we love each other. They were a huge help to me um, in providing information about their life with their father and mother. Um, we're extremely close, so it could not be better. Roy asked, uh, does Jonathan have a picture of his great grandparents from Muskoka? Um, I do. Uh, you mean Harry Reid and, or my great grandparents? Uh, great grandparents. Well, I do actually. I, I don't know what to say, but not right in front of me, but yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just looking for uh, other questions here. You know, John, there are many, many people have written, not with a question, but to say thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Mike, if I, if I could interrupt, um, yes. I, I have one question I would like to ask of everyone who's listening. Um, I mentioned um, Robert Warren, who I quoted. Robert Warren was in the Canadian Provo Corps I have tried to find any connection to him or his family uh, without success. He lived in um, Victoria and the letter we have from him from 1990, um, he was living at 478 Darwin Avenue. I don't know if he had children, if any family or extent, but I have not been able to track down anything about Bob Warren, whose letter was wonderful. He was a friend of William Allister, who's another well-known Hong Kong veteran. So I just ask if anyone has information, please pass it along. All right. So there, the, um, as I was saying, yeah, thank you, John. As I was saying, uh, so many people have written in with compliments about uh, the research that you've done, about the way that you've told your story. Uh, one person, Victoria, says it was so interesting and helped me understand better all that I was not aware of what may have been going on with my grandfather, mm -hmm. Dr. John Crawford. He seldom spoke of the war, which I think is true of uh, many of the men who came back. They, they didn't want to speak of what took place. Uh, they didn't want to share their experiences. They, they kept it buried. Um, I should say one thing, Mike. Um, there was a question just now about um, longevity. Uh, my father died at the age of 65. His great friend, George Pollock, died at the age of 65. And Captain Abe Franken died at the age of 65. Um, so, uh, I, I also should mention it might just be of interest because of um, what it reflects upon my father. This great friendship of Pollock and Reed lasted seven years. Um, in 1951, Pollock brought his bride um, to visit Jack in Vancouver and was introduced to his second wife. Um, it was such a difficult situation. My father said, I'll get back to you when this is all straightened out. And Pollock wrote me years later to say, I never heard from him or saw him again. Amazing. All right, uh, John and everyone in the audience, we're now an hour in and we'd like to keep these uh, to an hour, that's our plan. So I'm going to stop the questions now, but
I want to do two things. First of all, tell you about our next event, which you see on the screen. I mentioned earlier, April 19th, um, the postal history of C4. So you will be receiving uh, an emailed invitation uh, for that around the beginning of April. Um, and we've been through questions already. So I mentioned the, the discussion group. Um, in the next 24 hours, you're going to receive an email from the HKVCA, and there will be two things in that email. Uh, one of them will be a link to a Facebook discussion group, uh, which John will be participating in. And I, I invite you to click on that link um, and then to join the group. And then you'll be able to ask questions of John, to uh, share your own experiences, uh, from uh, your father or grandfather or relative who was in Hong Kong um, and share experiences and discuss that with, uh, with other members of the group. So please, uh, please do that. Um, and the other part, uh, the other thing that's included in that email will be a very brief survey, four questions, and we ask you to fill that survey out, please, uh, because this is the first of a series of events, as I mentioned earlier. And we really would like to have your feedback uh, to help us uh, make these events as, rel as relevant and as useful to you uh, in the audience as possible. So thank you everyone for joining this evening. Um, it's been a pleasure, uh, John, to, uh, to listen to you. And I'm so pleased that we had over 120 people participating this evening. Uh, and uh, I think that's a measure of just how interesting your topic was. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. And good night, everybody in the audience.